So today we are going to be unpacking one of the most famous Christmas movies of all, and that is The Grinch who stole Christmas. And it was 1966 when millions and millions of people tuned in to watch the How the Grinch Stole Christmas, Dr. Seuss's rendition of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. This hairy green guy who had such a small, small heart that he wanted to actually steal and kill and, and to stop Christmas. Can you imagine can you imagine that? Just like who would want to stop Christmas? Whose heart is that small that they would want to steal Christmas? I would like to believe that none of us here uh, or there would want to stop Christmas. That every one of us would want to enjoy, you know, the tinsel and the Christmas tree and the gift giving and the church services, all the beautiful nativity scenes and just remembering Jesus as a baby. But the reality is that the Grinch didn't want to do that. And there was an actual, an individual on this planet around Jesus's time that wanted to stop Christmas just like the Grinch did. That's right, he was the Grinch for, of the first Christmas. He wanted to end Christmas before it ever began. And so in Matthew records this story of this Grinch that wanted to end Christmas before it even started. So as we look at this Grinch, we'll see that he's a lot like this hairy green guy. He had a very small heart. And so in Matthew chapter two, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, don't miss that name, King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw the star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And so he, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for this child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Yeah. And so the Grinch, according to Matthew's account, is the one and only King Herod. And so Herod is the one that wants to eliminate Christ. And so he didn't have any desire to actually worship him. In fact, Herod has a desire to actually stop the story, stop Christmas, the story of redemption, salvation, because he had a small heart. And in fact, he and the Grinch both, they had something in common, and that was this small heart that they had. So you might ask, well, why would Herod have such a small heart? And so in the movie, the, the green Grinch gets a, we get a picture of how Dr. Seuss's Grinch had such a small heart. See, the Grinch came to Whoville like all the other little Who's, uh, how they did on, as a baby, but he wasn't like the other Who's. He was raised by a Who family though. And as he was raised by this Who family, he grew up and he just wasn't like all the other children. He was a little bit green, he was a little bit hairy but they loved him anyway. He was a unique little guy. He went to elementary school and as an elementary child who learned and grew like all the who's, he was just there doing life just like any other eight-year-old. And so he sees a cute little girl, Martha May. She was one of the who's and she thought he was cute too. And so there on that Christmas, when he was eight years old, getting ready for the class Christmas party, this little Grinch looking through all this stuff, trying to make sure that it's gonna be an amazing Christmas party. And he really gets into the Christmas spirit for the first time. And he melts down the family heirlooms to make a beautiful angel for the top of the Christmas tree. And then he remembers that the teacher told him that she wanted all of them to look their best. So he looks in the mirror and he sees his beard. None of the other Who children have beards. So he grabs a razor and he has his first shave. Now, any of you guys that had your first shave, you know it doesn't always go smoothly. And it doesn't go smoothly for the, for the little Grinch either. And so he goes to school with a bag over his head with his Christmas tree topper that, that was made out of his family heirlooms. And the teacher asks him, take the bag off of your head. So when he takes the bag off of his head, his face is all mangled. He's got cuts everywhere and all the children begin to make fun of him. Even the teacher laughs at him. Well, this wounds him deeply. And so he throws his 
tree topper. He picks up the Christmas tree. And as he throws it out the window, he screams, I hate Christmas. And it was this experience that actually caused the Grinch's heart to grow small. This wound, the wound of his past caused him to hate Christmas, to reject people, to isolate himself all alone. And you see, as I watch this movie and I see this picture of him, I can't help but think about how that happens in our lives a lot. That as I meet people, you know, day in and day out, you know, I meet people that are in their teens all the way up to people that are in their 90s. And I've noticed that all of us, we all sometimes have a tendency, if we're not careful, to deal with wounds from our past in a very unhealthy way. And if we're not careful, it will actually allow our hearts to shrink. And for those of you that are online, you know, there's a lot of you that have, are watching right now and your heart has grown small the same way that Mr. Grinch's did. You know, we, we hold on to bitterness and hatred and an offense as a result of something that has happened to us in our past. And for some of us, it may be just like the Grinch, you know, maybe those elementary years where we remember, you know, the playground experience or the classroom experience where, you know, rejection maybe overwhelmed us or maybe we never fit, felt like we belonged. And for some of us, maybe it was a family experience. You know, that rejection and that emotion or, you know, the even physical abuse that we, some of us have experienced within our family and those wounds have manifested themselves in other ways, even in our lives. For some of us, it may have been something that happened on a ball field or with a coach or, you know, with a teacher in a classroom, but somewhere along the way, we, we, we got wounded and I, I see people all the time that have to deal with the reality of wounds and it has actually set them back in their life. And it's affected the way that they live life and their heart and how they respond to life today. Those wounds I know can be very, very painful. And so today we wanna think about them for a minute because I recognize that the Grinch, he did everything he could to drown out the pain. And so this is what happens with wounds from our past. If we don't deal with them, if we don't acknowledge them, here's what we begin to do. We begin to try to drown out the pain and the noise of the wounds from the past in every way that we can. And it manifests itself in different ways, but we just try to drown out the pain. And as we follow the story of the Grinch, we find uh, that to be true in, in, our, in Jim Carrey's rendition. And so this this isolated incident at eight years of age calls him to hate Christmas, run to a ma mountain, isolated himself. And as an adult Grinch, he, that wound is still fresh. And the pain from his past, he just can't get away from it. And there on that mountain, he does everything he can to drown out the noise. As he hears the Who's singing Christmas carols, he is reminded of that wound from his childhood. So he puts a pillow over his ears to try to drown it out. He puts bolts and all his blenders to try to make as much noise as he can. He, he has a giant monkey hit him in the head with cymbals. It's crazy the things that he does to try to drown out the noise of his wound of the past. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna dig deep because the reality is that a lot of times we will do anything that we can in our life to get away from pain. We'll turn to pills, too much alcohol, anger, rejection, isolation. I mean, and it results in depression. We'll turn to entertainment, pleasure, anything that we can to drown out the noise of the wounds of our past. And so sometimes we're not much different than the Grinch. And so as a horrible of a man as this man Herod was, I think if we dig a little bit deeper, we can find some answers in the word of God to, that we could understand how to let go of some of those wounds of our past. In fact, as we follow that story of Herod, you know, the first Grinch that tried to eliminate the first Christmas, we find that his wounds manifested in a unique way. We don't know much about Herod in his early years, but I guarantee you just knowing what I know about why people do what they do, this man had a painful past. And I couldn't find anything historically that was evidence as to why he was the way he was, but his wounds manifested in some crazy, crazy ways in his life as an adult. 
and we know that it manifested its, its way, itself in such a way, according to history, that he was the key, the king from 40 BC to 4 BC, and he was an amazing builder. He built the temple in Jerusalem, but at the same time, he had this unbelievable character flaw as a result, I believe, of wounds of his past. And it was, it was this, he had an incredible lust for power and control in his life. And I would guess as a child, there was maybe something that happened to him that caused his life to constantly be out of control. And maybe, you know, for you, maybe your wound of the past is lack of control and chaos. So you have to be control, you have to control everything in order to not experience pain. And that's what I think happened with this guy. And as we read history, there are a ton of things that he did that revealed the pain, revealed the pain that he had. He would not allow anybody to rival him in power. He was suspicious of everybody. So much so that as he grew as a great king, even, even as he re rebuilt the temple and received praise from his people, he still, he murdered his wife, Marianne, and her mother as well. He killed his first son, his second son, and his third son as well. All of them were, he had assassinated. It is amazing what happened to him. In fact, the Roman emperor at the time, Augustus, he said this about King Herod in his older years, that it was safer to be his pig than to be his son. Herod's heart, watch this. His heart was so small that when it was time for him to die, he actually retired to Jericho, which was one of the, one of the beautifulest, the most beautiful city. And he gave orders that some of the most distinguished citizens of Jerusalem were to be arrested on trumped up charges and in prison. And then he ordered that the moment he died, they should all be killed as well. You see, he knew that nobody would mourn for him and he was determined that someone would share, shed tears when he died. That is a seriously wounded man pain of the past that manifested itself in such a lust for greed and power. But, and, and it wasn't very, it wasn't hard to try to figure out why he was trying to cut out this new king, Jesus, that was coming. See, this Magi showed up and when he heard the news that there was a new king, man, he couldn't have another king threatening his rule. And so in Matthew 2, 16, it says that he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Beth Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. Now that, that is a wounded individual. You see this wound manifested itself in him in such a way that all he could think about was himself. And here's what I want you to understand today. This is the big idea today, okay? When the wounds of the past leak into the future, they will always hurt those that are closest to us. Let me say that again. When we let the wounds from the past leak into our future, we will always hurt those that are closest to us. It'll manifest in such a way that we will not only hurt ourselves, but we will also hurt those that we love the most. You see, all that, all that matters is me. I have to protect me. We get selfish, that's what happens. And that's what happened with Herod. His life was lonely, his heart was hard, he was frustrated, he was confused, he had no joy at all. It was an incredibly lonely life for Herod. And so for Herod, it was a constant living of life in fear of who might overtake him. Suspicion reigned. And in his life, at the end of his life, he lived an incredibly lonely life to the point that when he died, he knew Nobody would care that he died because of all the anger, the rejection that had actually consumed him. And so today, what are the results in you and me? How do we find ourselves? How are the wounds of our past, how has that manifested itself in us? Because the reality is that's not where God wants us to live. He wants us to transform our hearts. God wants our hearts to be transformed. He wants our hearts to grow, to be like his. He wants to give us a new heart. And watch this, the prophet Ezekiel says it this way in chapter 36. He says, I will give you a new heart, a new spirit, and I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, a soft heart, a loving heart. 
And so the question is, how does this actually happen in us? And after we make sure that our past hurts, how can we actually make sure that those not only don't harm us, but don't harm those that love us and that we love? We have to understand it's the love of God that can heal the wounds of our past. And we have to expose our hearts to the light of his love. Because if we don't, those wounds of the past, will, they will actually leak into our future and hurt those that are closest to us. Isn't that what Cindy Lou Who did? She would not allow the fear and the uncomfortable nature of this mean, hairy Grinch to keep her from actually climbing up that mountain to see him and expose him to the light of love. She knew he needed love. In fact, in that story, you know, she, uh, she read up on the Grinch. She found out about his past. She understood who he was and why uh, he was like he was. And she didn't let that bother her. She ran up the mountain to see Mr. Grinch because she knew he needed a little bit of love. And you know, that's the beginning of a transformed heart is just exposing our heart to the light of God's love, invading darkness and, and looking for the light. And why? because that is the only way that a heart can be transformed is by exposing it to the light of love. So for us, what does that say about us? I mean, it, it means that we have to be a little bit like Cindy Lou. Rather than seeing people for who they are, we've got to recognize that they have, may have had pain and isolation, depression, addiction. All those things are just things that are trying to drown out the noise of the pain of the past. So we have to also be aware in our lives, just like Cindy Lou, we have to be able to get, get into those uncomfortable places with people. And, and sometimes people that are far from God and love them right where they're at, rather than pushing them away and staying in our warm little Christian bubbles, we've got to be willing to expose ourselves. And that's gonna invite us, that's gonna, that's gonna have us get uncomfortable sometimes to confront our own fears. But it also invites us to expose other people to God's love that lives big on the inside of us. Look, and if we're gonna help other people with this, we've gotta make sure that our own hearts are taken care of first. Because the truth is that when we let the, the wounds of our past leak into our future, we will always hurt those that are closest to us. And if we're hurting them, we certainly can't help them because we've got to know that it's only God's love that can change a heart. And watch this, in Romans 5, 8, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's only one thing that can, that can heal a heart of sin and brokenness, and that's to know that Jesus died for us. It doesn't say that he just said he loved us. He demonstrated it by allowing his son to be born as a man. That's Christmas, right? And, and so we invite people and expose them to the love that can heal them. And then something else that needs to happen, it's not just exposure. At some point, we have to actually accept it. You see, the love and the gift of love that Jesus gave us, it's a gift. We have to accept it and we have to open it. We have to receive it. But look, the promise is this. If we do that, we can have a transformed heart. Watch this. In Romans 10 and 9, it says, if you declare with your mouth, if you, if you declare with your mouth, maybe you've been here and you've been exposed to love even within this message. And despite anything that's happened in your past, I want to tell you that God loves you. And if you would declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from yourself. But more than that, saved from the darkness, saved from hell. And for some of us, we might feel like this is hell on earth because of everything that's happened to us. But listen, God's presence is still in your life. It's still here. We still have the holy presence of God in our life. And hell is a, compl a place completely absent from him or of him. And so we don't have to experience that because it says we will be saved. And then he goes on and Paul writes, verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
That's not my word. That's the scriptures telling you that yes, because of Christ, because of Jesus, if you accept that gift, you are forgiven, made new. God invites you to accept that gift. And it's a beautiful and powerful thing, regardless of how deep or how powerful your wounds are, the healing blood of Jesus can transform your heart if we accept his gift. Look, God's not mad at you. He's not angry at you. He wants a relationship with you. And, look, and there's nothing more beautiful than a heart that is transformed and healed. There's nothing more beautiful than seeing that. And the truth is that that's how it was for the Grinch. You see, Cindy Lou pursued him with love. It was a beautiful thing that his heart got transformed. Because you see, once he had stolen Christmas, he, and way up on the mountain with all of their presents, he could still hear, hear all the Who's in Whoville still singing, even though they had no presents. He had not stopped Christmas. And as he's trying to figure it out, the book says that he puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. And then he realized something that he hadn't thought before. Maybe Christmas doesn't come from a store. Maybe, just maybe, Christmas means a little bit more. And he was right. And so then he feels something in his chest and he falls on the ground in agony. And as he writhes around in the snow, asking his dog for help, he realizes that he is beginning to feel. And his little small heart grew three, or grew three sizes as it was being healed. And he begins to weep, just wondering what's happening to him. And suddenly the sun comes up, the light comes out and the sky is lit with beautiful pinks and blues. It's a beautiful scene and it's a beautiful thing when a heart is transformed. And the power of the gospel that we know is that God can transform a heart. When we are exposed to his light, the light of his love, and we accept that gift, the power of transformation is possible and it's beautiful. And that transformation allows us to be healed. And the dysfunction that maybe we bring to our parenting or to our marriage, the dysfunction that we might bring to the closest people around you, you know, that might look at us and say, hey, I kind of see this coming up all the time in your life. The people closest to you, they feel the manifestation of our wounds. I know it because that's the people that are closest to me. They have experienced that manifestation of my wounds. And look, if we live like that, then we will always live disabled. We can say, I'm forgiving, thank you, Jesus. But we can actually miss the powerful and abundant life that God has for us here. And so today, I wanna encourage you. Yes, experience salvation, but experience the power of that salvation. The power that is supernaturally breaking the bonds of wounds or the supernatural process that God wants to do in our heart. He wants us to be people who tell the story of His glory and how He is making His home in our heart. He wants to help us overcome our wounds. And we don't have to let the wounds of our past leak into our future and hurt those that are closest to us. See, it's time to let God heal our hearts by leaning into Him. And I know that God wants to do amazing things through you and it depends on us to actually step in and to allow Him to heal us, to allow Him to heal our hearts and then allow us to reach out and to help other people heal their hearts. And for some of you that maybe don't know God's love and His forgiveness yet, I just wanna let you know that God He's not mad at you. He's not angry with you. He loves you. And He has a plan for your life. And the problem is always that our sin separates us from God. And that's why Jesus was not only born as a child, as our Savior, but He also let men kill Him, nail Him to a cross, and that He paid for our sins that we would not have to be separated from Him. So today, I just wanna give you an opportunity to follow Him. If you'll claim him as your savior and you'll give your life over to him and turn away from the wrong things in your life and give your life over to him, the Bible says that you can have eternal life and that he will be here with you to walk with you through absolutely everything. So if that's you and you need that, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, 
I just wanna lead you in a prayer right now. And it's simply your commitment to give your life to God and to take on his life. So let's pray together. Father, I believe that your son Jesus died on that cross for my sin. And Jesus, I claim you as my savior and I give you my life. Make me whole in every area. I turn from all the wrong in my life and I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen.